Well, on this 25th day of December, we want to wish all of our Through the Bible family a Merry Christmas. And our hope is that this Christmas would be the Christmas that the Lord Jesus Christ is magnified in your life and in your home. And that's always, every day, our goal here at Through the Bible, isn't it, Greg? It is, Steve. And it's such a great opportunity for you and for me to to speak on behalf of not just the Through the Bible Board of Directors, which you're a member, and the, the staff of which I'm a member, but, but our global partners around yep. the world. And, you know, Steve, many of our partners are able to use Christmas. It's a foreign holiday in many parts of the world. And it's a wonderful time to do what you just said, which is lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and today's topic is appropriately on worship. And yeah, Dr. isn't McGee, that neat? <laughs> Yeah, he's got some really interesting things to say that most of our listeners, I don't think they've ever heard it before, unless they've been on the Bible bus multiple times. But after five years, they probably need to hear it again. That's yeah. true. Now, the best gift that you can give yourself this year, we believe, is to study the Word of God yourself, to get to know your Lord and Savior better. And I'm always big on New Year's resolutions. And hey, you still got four days left in this year. <laughs> Plan your yeah. time out. Commit yourself to be spending the next year every day, Monday through Friday, on through the Bible, listening to the program. Yeah, and Steve, you and I have been having the privilege of listening to this program for many, many years. And yeah. once you establish that habit, and there are many wonderful ways to do that. You can do it with podcasting like you and I do. You yep. can just make yourself a note. You can listen on the radio, on the Internet. Uh, we do encourage you to give yourself that gift of, of, of growing in God's Word. And, and also, today, we would like to encourage you as a way to celebrate this day to, to share a, a really neat booklet we have. Yeah. Yeah, it really is good. It's called Under the Tree, Eight Gifts That Jesus Gives You at the Cross. And by the way, the eight gifts are all based out of Romans chapter 5, and they are peace with God, access to God, hope, triumph in trouble, love, the Holy Spirit, deliverance from wrath, and then joy. And what great eight gifts that you could give to a loved one. And they're available in this booklet that you can download for free. And they wonderfully highlight these are needs that, that everyone has, no matter where they yeah. live, whether they follow Christ or not. These are benefits that everybody's looking for in their lives. Yeah. Now, here's a short introduction from Dr. McGee into today's study. Now, those of you that have been going with us through this epistle, you know that we have been walking through the tall corn. We've been treading on the mountaintops. We have been in flight in a jumbo jet. We have been riding a missile in space in this marvelous, wonderful epistle. And it's my longing and desire that we get a hold of some of these great spiritual truths. And may God deliver us from the cosmetic Christianity that's around us today, from funny fundamentalism, from the jumpers to the kneelers, the jumpers are the ones that have no ceremony at all, and it's all emotion. The kneelers are those that go through the ceremonies. They're up and down. I told a friend of mine back east, I preached for him, and he has a church like that, by the way. We all wear a robe when we're with him, and you go up and down. I told him, I said, after I've been through your service, I don't need to take my setting up exercises. I've had them. And so that we might grasp something very wonderful in this epistle. And I do want it to mean a great deal to a great many of you. Let's pray now and turn our attention to Hebrews 9. Heavenly Father, lead us through the wonderful truths in your word and teach us what it means to walk by faith as these people did. And then what it means to worship you in spirit and truth on this special day and then every day of the year. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come again to the ninth chapter of Hebrews, we come to a new division, and we're dealing with that which is actually the meat of the word. This is not milk that we're talking about now. Some little ceremony down here, or some little method, or some little program. We're talking now in this ninth chapter actually about worship. And the subject is, the first 10 verses, a new sanctuary better than the old. And then from verse 11 into the 10th chapter, we have a superior sacrifice. Now, we have given to us here two ministries that are in contrast. 
One was the Levitical service, the ministry in an earthly tabernacle down here. Then the sanctuary in which the Lord Jesus serves and what actually is real worship today. Now, I want you to notice something that is very important, and I'll read the first verse. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now, I'd like to call your attention to an improvement that can be made upon the words that are used here. Actually, the word for service speaks of ordinances of divine service. I think it could better be translated divine worship. And then a worldly sanctuary doesn't mean worldly as we think of it, but a sanctuary of this world. That is, it was made of materials of this world down here. It was made so long and so wide and so high. And there was a ritual that they went through in this sanctuary down here. In that sense, it was of the world. Now, it will be contrasted with a sanctuary that is in heaven. And there's some very important things we want to say right here. But let me read verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made. Now, we're not taken back to the temple. And there's no reference made to Herod's temple for the illustration, although there's been a reference made to it that there were still priests serving at the altar in the temple. Actually, when the type is given, the writer here goes back of the temple, any one of them that was built, and the third one was in existence at that time. He goes back to that very simple structure that God gave to Moses in the wilderness. There was a tabernacle made, and it was made of the things of this world. The first wherein was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called a sanctuary. That is, it was the holy place. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims beams of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, this is a very important passage of Scripture for us to see. To begin with, he's going to make a contrast now between this tabernacle that, as we've already seen, was made after the tabernacle in heaven. God showed Moses a pattern, and Moses followed that pattern, and that was after the one in heaven. But always at best, this was a tabernacle of this world, and it was much inferior, as we shall see, in many different ways to the tabernacle which is in heaven. And it was the place, however, of worship. Now, we find again this word worship used and translated a little differently in verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the worship, and our translation says, service of God. Now, I'd like to call your attention to something that's very important and this has to do with real worship. Not just a church service where an order of service is followed, where there may be a ritual that's not very complicated, or it could be a very complicated ritual. But when real worship takes place, that real worship is a worship that draws us into the presence of Christ, where we can adore him. Now, worship actually comes from the same root word, the old Anglo-Saxon word of worth. It is giving to someone that which is worthy. They are worthy to receive 
adoration and praise. That's worship. And the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy to receive our praise and our adorations. And then service follows from that. Real worship will always lead to service. You remember when the Lord Jesus answered Satan in the wilderness temptation? Here was an answer he gave, and he always quoted Scripture, and it was this. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, worship, if it's real worship, will lead to service. You don't have to beg and coax and goad people into doing something if they are participating in real worship of Christ, because real worship leads to service. Now, many of us ministers spend a great deal of time urging people to do something, you know, for God. Urge them to give. Urge them to do visitation. Urge them to teach. Urge them to sing. Urge them to do something. Well, real worship will lead to service, always, if it's real worship. And maybe we just didn't provide real worship. Now, the first thought that's in worship is that of rendering, therefore, homage and adoration and praise in the presence of God to our wonderful Savior. And that worship is a service, and it leads to real service out yonder where the rubber meets the road. That's when we roll up our sleeves, and that's when we spit on our hands and we get to work for the Lord. May I say to you, worship is adoration right through this section here. Now, I want to say that real worship is only possible through Jesus Christ. The ritual of the tabernacle actually never got the people into the presence of God. The high priest alone went into the Holy of Holies. Now, the tabernacle proper was just a big gold box, 30 cubits long. That would be about 45 feet and 10 cubits wide. That would be about 15 feet and 10 cubits high. And it was in turn divided into two sections. In the holy place, there was, as we're told here, these certain articles. For instance, there was the table of showbread, the golden lamp stand, and then there was in the background the golden altar, the altar of incense, and it speaks of prayer. No sacrifice was ever made there. Now, in the Holy of Holies, where the high priest went, and it was separated by a veil, why, there were two articles of furniture. There was the ark. It was just a box made out of gopher wood overlaid inside and outside with gold. On top of it was a very highly ornamented top called the mercy seat. Cherubim beam were made there. They looked down upon the top of the box, and that's where the blood was placed. That's what made it a mercy seat, because the Lord had said to them in Leviticus, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now we find here that there's been a little change made. We're told that Inside the Holy of Holies, there is this censer, as it is called here, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Now, why does he move it on the inside? Well, to begin with, the veil has already been removed. The veil is down today. That veil speaks of Christ, and it speaks in particular of the life of Christ, made of fine twine Egyptian byssus linen with the cherubim beams woven into it. And it speaks actually of the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Now, when he died on the cross, he gave his life on the cross, his human life, that veil was rent in twain. And the way to God now is wide open because he's made a way. He says, no man cometh to the Father but by me and the veil has been rent in twain, we can come right in to God's presence today. But what happened to that golden censer, the golden altar? Well, it's moved inside. 
Didn't Aaron on the great day of atonement, didn't he with the blood come by that altar? Didn't he take a censer and fill it with coals and then put incense and went inside? In other words, he is transferring, as it were, he's transferring the altar of incense to the inside at that particular time. But of course, he picked up that censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar and had sweet incense on it. He brought it back out. Here you have the transferring of it into the Holy of Holies, but he brought it out and he's going to do it again next year. We got a great high priest. He's our great intercessor, always at the golden altar there making intercession for you. And his prayers are heard, by the way. Therefore, it's on the inside, but it's also on the outside. You and I can come through him by prayer. And that's what Paul meant, that being justified by faith, we not only have peace with God, but we have access to God. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is something that is quite interesting. Now he mentions here also what was in that ark. He tells us that there was in it the golden pot that had manna. That speaks of the present ministry of Christ and feeding those that is own. He feeds them with his word. He's the bread of life. And you get the bread at the bakery, which is the Bible. The Bible is God's bakery. And if you want bread, that's where you're going to go for it. And Aaron's rod that budded, that speaks of the death and resurrection of Christ because that was a dead rod and life came in it. And the tables of the covenant. And that meant the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law. Now we have this presented to us here as real worship. This is real worship, if you please, that he's presenting to us at this time. And I want you to note that as we move down here now, verse 7, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. What he's telling us about now is the great day of atonement. In one sense, that was the high day, the Yom Kippur, the high day in the life of that nation. That is the day that the great high priest went in for the nation and went in, and on the basis of that, the nation was accepted for another year. Now, our great high priest has gone in to the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God itself. He's gone in there and hasn't come out yet. He's going to be there as long as we're in the world. And when he comes out, he's coming out after his own because we are part of him today. We're the body of Christ. And the purpose of all of this is to make real to your heart and my heart the presence of the Lord Jesus. Today, did you start out with him? This is a hurly-burly world that you and I are in today, and it has no time for him as you rushed in on the freeway or wherever you rushed to today, and probably some of you at home now. Did he go with you? Was he with you today? That's the purpose of this, and you can worship him. You don't have to go to a church and sing the doxology. However, that is something he's going to urge here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And you do need to meet with God's people, and there needs to be this concerted corporate worship today. It's very essential, but you can worship him at the end of a cotton row or corn row. You can worship him on the freeway. You can worship him in the office. You can worship him in the classroom. Friends, you can worship him anywhere. I don't care where you are, you can worship him. And this is something that always so needed today, that you and I pour out our hearts in adoration and praise unto his holy name. Now, the high priest has gone in for us today. And you can see how superior it is to this, where he went in just one day, and he only stayed, he hurried. In fact, he had a chain around his 
foot because if he had done anything wrong, he would have been struck dead and they'd had to pull him out and get a new high priest. But ours has gone in, and that is the wonder and glory of it all, that he's been able to go into the very presence of God for you and me today. Someone has made a little different translation here of Hebrews 9, 24, and I'm going to turn to that. For Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, like in pattern to the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us. Moses said to God, let me see your face. God says, you can't do it. I've got a high priest that's gone into the very presence of God. Now, we don't worship by going through ritual today, friends. We don't worship by burning candles or burning incense or having a nice little altar fixed up today. Now, Protestantism has sure gone over to this. I have a very fine friend. I hold meetings for him, and he's as sound as a dollar. But he told me last time as I asked him, I said, why in the world you got the cross down there on the table of the Lord's Supper? Oh, he says, not only that, did you notice the candles? Well, I hadn't noticed those, but he had a candle at each end of the table. He says, that's to help the people with their worship. My friend, if you need that kind of help, you're not worshiping him. The Lord Jesus Christ said to that woman at the well, you remember, she said, now, where shall we worship God? Here in this mountain, and we have a ritual, or over at Jerusalem where we burn candles and incense. The Lord Jesus says, believe me, woman, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers are going to worship God. How? In spirit and in truth. And I got another friend. He's very much tied up in Jewish evangelism, which is very good. But he's got a candelabra in his church. He has a menorah, has seven candles on it. And I like to kid him because I know him real well. I said, my, you put in a new heating system here in your church. Oh, he was offended. He says, mine, no. He says, this is to keep our minds centered on the fact that we have an obligation, Jewish people. I said, my friend, if you need that sort of thing, then you're not really worshiping God today. Oh, I long for that, not only for you, but for myself, that I can get into his presence and I can smell the sweet incense of his presence not with my nose, but with my heart and with my soul and my mind. May I be conscious of the sweetness of his presence. And may I walk in the light of his word. And may there be reality today in my life. Oh, I crave it for myself, friends. And I covet it for you today, that you and I might know what reality is. Oh, if we just quit drinking milk and put aside that little nipple on the bottle that we've got. I've got several letters here before me. I've got such wonderful letters. But one dear lady, oh, she finds fault with the fact that we don't write her a personal letter with every gift she sends in. She doesn't realize that we are cut down to the bone here in staff. We cut down our overhead as much as we can. We are trying to get out the Word of God. Oh, if I could just get that over. But she wants the bottle with a nipple on it and wants to be burped every now and then. Oh, how we need today to get into the presence of the living Christ. He's our great high priest. He's ministering yonder at a better tabernacle than here on this earth. And the children of Israel worship God around that tabernacle we can worship the living Christ today. May there be reality today in our worship. Now, we're going on from there next time into this ninth chapter, which again is another wonderful chapter. Until next time, may God bless your hearts, my beloved, and enable you to worship him and smell the sweet incense of his presence. During this season, we hear a lot about shepherds and wise men worshiping the baby Jesus. But it's also our greatest opportunity to worship the living Christ, who is our great high priest in heaven today. I'm grateful for the insight from today's study, and I hope you are too. On this day of gift giving, we offer you these Bible studies with the hope that 
They would help you grow deeper in your love for Jesus and God's Word. We also want you to know that we're grateful for you, our faithful listeners, who invest in this ministry through prayer and financial partnership. If God has used through the Bible to encourage you this year, would you consider how God wants to use you in taking his whole word to the whole world? What a gift that is. To find out how, go to ttb.org forward slash give or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, wishing you a Merry Christmas, and I'll be saving a seat on the Bible bus tomorrow as we continue our five-year journey through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.